I truly believe everyone can and should sing if they, if it calls to them. And I want to show them that they're, my method of teaching is a way I wasn't taught. It's like all of the things that we're talking about. It's the in-between. It's not what's on paper. It's not the way things have been done in the past. It's not in the tunnel. Like we don't sing do re mis. There's none of that. We are, we're definitely like giving you tools to understand how your voice works, how, how it feels to you. So you can say, oh, I didn't know that part of my voice existed. I didn't know I could do that. That's through play and curiosity. Hey, I'm your host, Ronya Sakata, queen of joy. That's how my friends call me, talking to you from Zurich, Switzerland. I want to make this world more joyful and playful and colorful because we don't have a guarantee for tomorrow. So let's enjoy today. Will you join me? I'm all in. I founded the Joy Academy for exactly that reason. And on the Let's Create Joy podcast, we talk visions, dreams, self-care, habits, challenges, creating joy and much more in motivational solo episodes at the beginning of the month and inspiring talks with my wonderful guests. Make sure to follow me on Instagram at Joy is my compass for getting fun and tangible daily inspiration for our monthly topic. You make the difference and you are the most important person in your life. Yes, we can live our best lives right now while we have our big vision in our head and heart. Let's dive right in. Enjoy. Welcome Lisa Townsend to the Let's Create Joy podcast. I'm so happy that you're here. I'm so curious what you will share with us. And as always, we start with who are you? What do you do and what brings you joy and how do you create joy in your everyday life, like intentionally or accidentally or <laughs> just how do you do life and fill it with joy? Oh, it's so good to be here. It's so good to see you. And thanks for having me. I uh, am Lisa Townsend. I am um, a board certified music therapist. I am, I, you know, it's so funny that sometimes we start with our business accolades, but I'm a sister, I'm a daughter, I'm an auntie to three boys. Um, and yeah, my passion is music. So I, um, I'm a music therapist. I work with kids at a school two days a week. Um, I do lots of things with music, which I'm sure will come up because it's, it is a source of joy for me. And I, I have been helping women. I, I've been doing some vocal coaching for the last handful of years. And I work primarily with women who have felt disempowered with their voice at some point. Um, you know, we all have little things that people have told us um, about our voice. We're either too loud. That was me. Um, <laughs> too much. That was me. Yes. Some of us are making it our profession. <laughs> we use it to our advantage. Sometimes we're too quiet. We don't speak up or, um, you know, lots of things like that. And I, uh, from, from the music angle, bringing the joy of singing to people as a means, a creative means to practice what it's like to become emboldened by your voice or to rediscover your voice, to find new ways to express yourself outside of public speaking, which can be so scary, um, or spotlight moments, which is like, this is a spotlight moment to me. I mean, I kind of like nickname any time where you feel uh, maybe nervous about sharing your words, sharing yourself with others as um, finding a way to check in with your voice, check in with your breath and really trust what your instrument. Uh, we do that through singing. So that's what I've been doing this last handful of years. And um, I've written lots of uh, custom songs for people. Some of that, some of that I don't even advertise. Um, and have built a community choir here in my town. So yeah, a, a lot of what I do is, is music based, which is actually then my answer for <laughs> what, what brings me joy. Cause it, it is a place it's always been a source of joy for me. So creating by myself, creating with others, piano, guitar, and lots of instruments behind me over here. Isn't um, it amazing if that's your profession? I mean, it could be a hobby, you know, you have like a half an hour per day to, 
to do that or you just do it all day long and make money with it. I love that so much. Yeah. I used to say <clears throat> that my passion is my profession and that feels like such a strong and, you know, true statement for me. <clears throat> Pardon me. I, yeah. And I, I just grew up singing. My grandmother sang she sang barbershop and actually I learned this recently she's 92 she still sings in her choir um back in New York but she she raised four children and after that so she was in her 40s when she went on tour in a barbershop choir with three other women and tour would be you know western New York and into Canada so and cool. singing barbershop yeah and she so said what me, barbershop means for i don't know what it is so yeah. maybe some, some i wondered people don't know what that is yeah barbershop is four part harmony okay. often a cappella, so without any other yep. music yeah she just sent me a cd and uh and so yeah it's very like it's very like 1930s yeah 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 um, and the men used to wear big top hats and bow ties and the women did, she has a picture of them in their, um, you know, uniforms, but yeah. And which means that one of the women was the low bass, you know, one of them had a really low voice and then one of them had the high. So they, um, and they competed and traveled. And so she took us to theater. She always had a piano. She, she played piano fairly well. So music was always around. My dad played guitar, just hobbyist. Um, but he would sing, my joke was that he would sing the Eagles and the Beatles. And especially with the Beatles songs, he'd like forget some of the lyrics. And so I, I thought those were like his songs. I didn't know they were. Oh, so cool. You thought that's daddy's songs. Oh, Specifically wow. Rocky Raccoon, which is a funny Beatles song if you've ever listened to it. No, but it's no. like a storytelling. Yeah. So that's the one I remember. Like, oh, he doesn't remember the words. Maybe it's because he, you know, he wrote it. He's just making it up as he goes kind of a thing okay. um and then you know my mom would say that the musical gene skipped her and all of her so it's her mother who sings okay that's what I was day. thinking of is it your father or yeah no it's my mother's side although my dad would say his his father was also musical I never saw him um we lived further away from his parents so that wasn't as present for me but yeah my mom and her three siblings would say the, the musical gene skipped them and went to all the grandkids. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. yeah, so we could never do like, there was an old TV show here called, um, oh gosh, it was Ed McMahon. What was it? I just lost it. Anyway, there was like a talent show well before American Idol or You've Got Talent, uh, America's Got Talent, those shows. Um, oh, Star Search, Star Search was what yeah. it was called. And like Britney Spears got her start there. If you could watch those old yeah. videos. Yeah. My grandmother I, I grew was up without the TV, so I don't know it, but but uh, I <laughs> of course knew that uh, Britney and Justin Timberlake and the Mickey Mouse Club, some kind of like started like there. Yep. They did. Yeah. And so the point of that was just that my grandmother thought we would be like the four generations. So like she, my mom, my sister, and one of our other family members, like the four of us could uh, sing together harmony, but my mom could never hold her, hold her place in harmony, which is difficult. It's very yeah. difficult. Yeah. So she's the kind of person who thinks I can't sing. I've never sung. And, you know, I think that is it really you. true or did she have some traumatic experience? You know, my, I still remember my neighbor at where in the house I grew up, we were four families and he was like I don't know like 40 when I was a kid and he said he never sang at Christmas and I was like why are you not singing and he said in primary school the chorus teacher told me to just move my lips and don't sing because you can sing I mean hello Ronia that's what I'm working against <clears throat> you know I think that's say, so think. detrimental and I don't think it's true because here's, you know, I would say this is a fun fact for, for people who don't think about it. And some of this has just come through talking with folks and reflecting on my own time in school and doing some early learn early childhood learning. When I, you know, I teach, um, I have taught in the past family music classes. And the foundation for music is to be able, the ability to be able to hear something before you can produce the sound. 
So you have to be able to hear it and then you can sing it. But audiation is a muscle. It's a, it's a tricky muscle. And if we start, that's why early childhood learning is so interesting. You know, kids can pick up multiple languages. Children can really check in with, um, with music and rhythm and tonality of things. That's why we teach it so early because it's a muscle. Because if you didn't have like dedicated exposure in that way to music, Sometimes it's natural. Sometimes that come, that ability comes naturally, but for a lot of us, it doesn't, or we need like repeated reminding and training to train our ear to hear. And if we can hear it, we can usually produce it. So that's a, that's a crucial piece, but they're not teaching that in choir. And in fact, I went to a choir concert for my friend's son this week. It's a middle school choir. They were all wonderful. <clears throat> but the kids were singing in a way where they had lots of breath in their sound and they're singing very high into their ranges, like the big Broadway, sh you know, shows, big Encanto, Hamilton pieces, like Rent, all of these big pieces for little voices. And they were using a technique in their voice that was very breathy, like kids sing. And I thought to myself, well, they're old enough to learn some new techniques with their voice. So it doesn't hurt so much because there's only so much air you can use to hit certain notes in singing. This is what makes people think they can't sing. It's not, it's a technique. It's, you can change how you access your voice. And I thought to my, my friend, who's also a musician, a vocalist, I said, why aren't they teaching that? And she and I both reflected that most choir teachers are not singers. They are music educators. So their job is to teach you the foundations of music from an education standpoint. And they want you to all be in tune, so they want you to sound good. So if the kid over here is taking you out of tune, your goal is to have everybody sound good. You're, gonna, you're not gonna help him. You're gonna tell him to zip it up, which I just think is so detrimental. There's some of us who never get over that, right? Yes, never, of course. He's, he never voice. sang after that, like yeah, that's, for decades. It hurts my heart. I'm, I'm working against that. It, all of the people who ever told someone to stand in the back or play the drums or not to sing, um, because I do think, and, and listen, joy comes in lots of forms. For me, it is through the voice and through music. Some people just don't connect that way. I do think we all connect to music in our own ways, but physically using your voice can also feel really traumatic if you've had those experiences. Singing brings up emotions. It can be really uncomfortable. I mean, it's you know, it, it happens for me uh, where I'll be singing something and just the, the, the lyrics and the music just chokes me up. Um, and so some people don't like that sensation or that feeling of like, it's bringing up, it's touching a place beyond words. Yes. And yet for the people who like to work with me, that is our superpower. We say, we, we want to use this creative tool to access those parts. I'm pulling, I had a client this week who pulled a song that would be, I think I posted about this online. She was going through a business transition and said, I think I'm in this metamorphosis um, and, and I need a song that reflects like that I am the, the squishy caterpillar. I'm not yet in a cocoon. I'm not yet a butterfly. I think I'm a squishy caterpillar. And I said, great, I'm here for it. Like, what did you, what song do you want to sing? <laughs> and she said, I found one. It's actually about a caterpillar and we laughed and then we say, oh, cool. and for her, that was just a way, you know, she didn't tell me why, she, you know, this is not always work where people share the whys. They just kind of come with, now that I know more about my voice, I want to tap into a song that I need this week because I'm going through something and music is something I connect to. And I just think that's beautiful. So that's the very long winded, like, who am I? What do I do? And also a bit of you know, what, what initially sparks joy for me is being in community with others, creating music. That's, that's where it all started. And that's where it, it is today too. <laughs> it's where, where in your life did you choose consciously yeah. like this will be my work? You know, sometimes we love something yeah. and we consciously decide that will stay my hobby. I don't want to make it my profession or the other, the other decision is to go all in. Was there yeah. a moment or did you slide into this, in the, into this profession? I sure did. I, I always say that I loved my high school choir director. We 
all just adored Mr. Simicata. And that sounds yeah. Japanese. Simicata. Yeah, I don't know his background. I um, and it's funny, like when you think back, I, I feel like I only knew him as an older, an older guy because of course, it's like I, I picture him with his grayer hair and um but he just instilled, he was just such a dear heart. And I think he instilled his love of music in us. And of course that was, a, you know, a community of choir kids who toured together and, um, and sang together was really unique in high school. I think that's one of those things that really um, felt, if I felt out of place other places, I felt right at home in choir. And I think I, I think I wanted to just create something similar, right? I wanted to be like Mr. Simicata. I don't know that I thought I want to lead like conductor choir because that, that in this moment doesn't spark joy. I'm like, mm, I don't know that that was it, but I wanted to be like him in many ways. So I researched the college that he went to and it was, you know, in my hometown, well, not in my hometown, but in my home state. And so I applied and I went to school for music education because again, that's like the, that's the foundation, I think, if you're going into music. And I thought, well, I mean, what else would I do? I, I love music and I love teaching. I love children. Those were like, well, music and children. Let's narrow it down. Those were the two <laughs> things. And very soon into my college, like within one semester, I knew I was in the wrong field and at the wrong school. And I think the way I can summarize it was that I didn't want to be, I didn't want to teach a classroom of 35 young children, the, the um, how would I say this? Like the foundations of music because music theory to me, so reading on a music on a staff, reading rhythms, that's actually not easy for me. It comes difficult. Like for me, the, the ability to improvise and, you know, like, to hear music and, and emulate it and like be, be, be part of the musical journey is where my joy comes from. But like sitting down in front of a piece of music and playing, let's say the piano or the guitar, just like what is written on the page is very hard for me. I now know more about my brain than I did then. But to me, I was like, this is not the part of music I love. Like, where's the fun stuff? That's what I, I kept thinking like, I don't want to teach this. I don't even, I forget all of the time, the value of a dotted eighth note. It's too much math for my brain, you know, cause music really is math. Yes. And that felt hard. So I, so with all of that, I was like, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want a classroom of 35 kids. And I don't want to be teaching the things about music that I find challenging myself. Challenging or boring or both or I think it's challenging because there's parts of music. When I got to college, I had to write, like I had to write a fugue or like different types of, of old styles of music to learn the music theory and the, the how and the why, why certain distances in music are considered hard for the ear to hear and some why they're pleasurable. And so we had to like compose. That was a fun, challenging but fun class because I could figure it out because I because I I could see the end result and I could feel um like pride in what I created and because my piano or the teacher who was a pianist who taught that class would sit down and play play our fugues for us so we could hear all of the parts together and I thought what was in my head and what I put on paper is exactly you know it's he's I couldn't play my own fugue very well but he could and I thought, oh, he made that sound so beautiful. So that was like, it's challenging, but the other stuff is like, just didn't bring me joy. So I honored that sensation that like <clears throat> knowing, and I left that college after only one semester. And then I went to a community college in my hometown and I, I lived back at home for a while, which wasn't easy, but it was the right choice. And I took great classes, English literature, Italian. Like I took a math class, but um, my mom knew some of the professors. So she found me one who she thought would be helpful for me because it was a place of struggle for me. And 
I loved that so much. And then I heard about a college down in North Carolina. So I'm from Western New York. I heard about a college in North Carolina in Charlotte. And I thought, well, I'm just going to go visit. They have this program called music therapy. Okay. I don't know what that is. I've never heard of it, but it sounds great. So like, I'm going to go. And so I did. And it was a beautiful campus. I had, I had actually some people that I knew went to school there. I got some extra credits for some previous um, educational work I had done to go to this school. So it kind of like all aligned. And I thought, well, it's a beautiful campus. And I think music therapy sounds great. And what I got to see was an on-site clinic of children with intellectual and developmental disabilities being in therapy, in music therapy, just like they would for speech therapy or physical therapy or occupational therapy. But I saw them using music as the tool to access non-musical goals. So here's me, this is me, right? Like, don't teach them what a dotted, you know, the value of that is and how to clap it or put it into their feet. Some of that came later when I taught family music classes, but never saying like, never the black and white on the paper, Rania, you know, it's like, like, what does that feel like? What does it feel like to put this beat into your body? What does it feel like to, what's the sensation that it brings? That's, I feel like so much of my work is that somatic piece and watching music therapy in action was like, oh, they're using music as a, as a tool to get to language, as a tool to get to building social skills, as a tool to building fine motor skills. Um, and that was like, yeah, I'm in. I, I don't even know where else this could go. And and uh, so I've been talking a lot. So we can, you know, we can talk about other things. But this is very um, much at the heart of like, how did you find it? Kind of by accident, but also following what sparked, like that knowing that joy oh, and recognizing what didn't and saying there's nothing wrong with that. I think that challenge is there for a reason. Listen to your intuition and 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 make a pivot and see see what else is available. Yeah, I think that's and that's why I don't interrupt you when I find it so interesting to hear, you know, that's life. We don't have to have the straight path. We can walk into this direction and it's not wrong if you arrive at the point where like no, that's but you learn stuff, you 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 have puzzle pieces which are helpful maybe in 10 years, you never know. Or you met somebody who will be important whenever, like it's never a failure and and um, step by step. And if you listen to your intuition and your feelings, you're like, oh no, but you could have followed through because you did that decision and we are not quitting things, you know? And then it gets hard and and and, I'm absolutely sure that we get ill if we constantly don't listen to our wishes and dreams. So that's what I encourage also my coaching clients and in the Joy Academy to just like, joy is my compass. What brings me joy? This, no, this, yes. So how about going into the joyful direction? And sometimes it's not not possible right now, but maybe in one month or like you have to, like struggle a little more, but then it's over or life is not always sunny, shiny, but then we can do another decision and make it sunny, shiny, joyful because we want to, and we have the power to decide things which bring us joy. So yes. Yes. And I think we talked just before we started recording the word for me that, that I think strongly combines with joy is like resonating what resonates with you if something resonates then and you follow that kind of feeling that um because I think we know what like you mentioned just what brings us angst or like that whatever we call that a challenge or it feels like an obstacle or a you know this is presenting itself and it's not it's not bringing you joy it doesn't resonate with me when you when you shift into recognizing those small moments, um, they're not small. They're actually, if you can take those and translate those to bigger decisions, bigger choices um, in everyday life, from small things to uh, like I'm I'm I had a I had a thing last night where a friend just um, had, we had dinner plans, but there was something about the energy of our conversation that didn't feel right. 
And I just thought, you know what? I think I just need to be on my own tonight. And I know that means canceling plans with this friend, but there was just something off. And as it turns out, I then got some news that was really just hard for me. And if I had gotten that news when I was with that friend, it would have been the wrong time and place for me to have received it. I just, it's like that, I didn't know why. Something didn't resonate. It didn't feel good. It didn't bring me joy to say, yes, I'll see you soon for dinner. It's like, nope, there's something that feels off and I don't, I can't name it. That was an honoring and that's hard to do. Those are, those are hard, hard yeah. moments. <clears throat> and, and yet she was fine, you know, said, it's fine. We'll catch up next week. And then I was in the space I needed to be in for what, what happened in the afternoon. And it's, it's like, that was, that was what it was meant to be, but I, I can't name that. It's like, that's the intangible. Yeah. And for me, that's like high level doing life on a higher level, right? If yes. but saying no to a friend and you already said yes, and you, you have that in your calendar, that's something we are taught is wrong to, to do, to say I'm, and another, another, um, possibility would have been that you have some weird excuse or lying you know like no let's just say today I can't I don't want to go it's not because of you and then you are staying at home and and you got the explanation why you felt that way but even if not you would have just had a a, a beautiful quiet evening to yourself I think that's so important honoring that and we got taught to not listen to our inner voice all life long like hug aunt, auntie so and so and you think she's disgusting or just like don't do that to your kid and I know in America you have this hugging culture I think that's really really not working for boundaries if you get taught as a kid it's not okay to say no to to hugs and I know there are parenting styles and all yeah you know and cultural things mm -hmm. but let's teach our kids and let's find out for ourselves this is what I want to do and I don't want to do this I just don't want to and that's okay I don't need a lie I don't need an excuse I don't need a good reason it's just because I feel that way And of course, I don't mean like selfishly, you know, some people are doing reservations in Zurich in three restaurants just to decide in short no notice where to go and they don't even call the other places. So that's just rude, you know, that's not listening to your voice. That's just not, not okay. So yeah. the fine line of being egoistic and being true to yourself, I think, it's a training to find that how, how does life work for me best? And it's not the same in every, every area of your life or in every timeline, like, yeah, but ongoing, like, like you said. Mm -hmm. And I think I, that's where our work overlaps a lot <clears throat> and that we're allowing, allowing people to have those moments of reflection or giving them permission to take time for that reflection and truly honor what they need in the moment and not the needs of others. Because again, like you said, it's not, there are times where it can be very, whatever, selfish is a tricky word or it's seen as selfish. Certainly that's true, right? The judgment is, well, that's selfish. She, you know, we had plans, so she canceled it. Um, and then there's also like, you know, there's times where honoring yourself means that you're showing up. If I can't show up pre in the present moment for you, then our time together isn't what you would, you would want anyway. Or um, yeah, so honoring, honoring your true feelings and you use the word joy and the, the, the idea and that sensation that comes with feeling joy. I do it through resonance, like did what you say Is that truly how you felt? Are you saying what somebody else needed to hear? Never wrong, but just like a, a connection point. Like, can I notice that I said something that is like out of harmony with me, disharmonious? 
for this moment, or should I speak my truth in this moment? And there's always, you know, again, there's no, there's a lot of what you and I talk all the time. It's like these, um, not levels, but there's like, um, it's, it's not always clear. It's not always clear. Sometimes you have to practice it to feel the muscle to then say, oh, oh, that's, and then name it. That's what that is. Okay. Then, yeah, I'm speaking with integrity. I'm acting with integrity. I am, um, I'm choosing something that's going to bring me some joy. And I'm not going to feel bad about that because I am important also. And the people that I spend my time with are important. And if I can't show up, um, you know, in a way that serves them and our relationship, then that's okay. You know, there's, there's, it's like a permission. Maybe it's like we give people permission. Yeah. So, and, and sometimes you are again in a situation where you're like, oh, fuck, I said yes again. So don't be hard on yourself and just remember next time before you say yes, like give yourself a little time and like, actually, I'm not coming. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, I love this situation when you receive a card, you know, an invitation card for a big party or, or a wedding you know if you want to go or not and mm -hmm. just tell them in the beginning don't say oh i'm not coming two days before you know your place card is already prepared that's just stupid but if you really know it when you get this card like oh i won't be there but i wish them the best you know that's that's okay yes and you know i I'm so glad the conversation is going this way because so much of when I say I'm a voice coach, people think I'm like, oh, my nine-year-old daughter wants to sing. And I think that's great. I have a lot of friends who, who, and I love working with children. I have done that. But my shift is really to us, those of us who need to retrain not only our outer voice, but you just mentioned like the inner voice. Your inner voice knew the answer. And then all these other things came into play. Oh, but I should because so and so is going to be there or, oh, I have to. And, and sometimes that's true. Again, I don't judge the moments where we speak out of alignment or out of resonance. I just think if like you're mentioning, if you can like check in and say, well, I, I knew the answer. So why did I, why did I say yes when I meant no? If we can have that reflection, it helps inform anything else that comes after, right? And we can yeah. notice those patterns about ourselves and say, oh, you know what? I'm a yes person. I never say no. And actually, I think, who was it? Um, was it Shonda Rhimes who wrote a whole, wrote a whole book on like, oh no, she's, she wrote it, a book about a year of saying yes. But think about, and I know someone did this, like a year of saying no, where you just like honored your boundaries maybe maybe that book hasn't been written maybe yeah, maybe that's it. your book but you know I think that's those are just as powerful um more more powerful and they take a ton of practice but if we I always say that singing makes us better listeners because it's how we're using our voice how we hear ourselves how we start listening to others when you learn vocal techniques you start to hear it in other places singing or not um, you and can, so when you you're read people's speech better, can't you like, Ooh, I think he's nervous or he's not true. That's not true confidence or, you know, like you get, you get finer fine tuning in, yes. in, uh, not only the hearing perception, but for, for the whole situation. Right. Yes, that's exactly right. And so when you're fine tuning, I love so much that you use that, it, you know, when you, when you fine tune something or, you know, I've used the word like disharmony and resonance, some of these, you know, musical terms, but they, they translate well to speech. So spoken word, singing, and then we're talking inner voice here too, which is often harder to listen to, but the more you learn about your own voice, the more you hear yourself, the more you start to listen to others, I think the more you can tap into your inner voice, which is hard to train. <laughs> it's a different, it's a totally different muscle, but the better you get at hearing it, maybe, maybe it starts with hearing it. Yes. Again, hearing, and then you can, you know, and as, then you as can, said before. exactly. That's a good full circle moment with that. So yeah. yeah, it's all really important stuff. And I think again, the way that our work aligns is that 
um, we're in process with people, right? We were like this, you can't just like, joy isn't a light switch. It can be, there, there can be moments where you say like, you know, I'm making an intentional choice, but usually that then also come, comes in with kind of like, well, who am I and what do I need? And that is a part of, a part of the work that I do through singing um, to just have people tap in a little bit more. And yeah, I mean, sometimes joy comes from like having to express it. So yeah, we have a lot of fun parallels in the work that we do and the people that, that come to, to, to be more creative and explore these ideas. They are not, they are not like, they're not like a goal. You know what I mean? Like some things, some work is like, oh, if I could just get to this thing, then I'll have the tools I need. And I think for us, we're in this, again, I don't know, I will have to come up with a word for it, but there's always a journey. Long, long journey, yeah. It's a journey. It never ends and there is no yeah. limit. And um, it's so personal, you know, I think it's so important that we also honor if we're a quiet person, we don't have to be loud. I had one client she was um she had her own company and she said you know I have to speak up more and be louder and I was like why yeah they say that in my company and said well they can say that but you can whisper and be very powerful you know when mm -hmm. when I was teaching professional school uh, food technologists for 12 years and taught them process engineering and and um, raw material um science and all kinds of microbiology and hygiene and you don't have to be louder to have a quiet classroom you can just whisper and like you have to be like what yeah you can't hear me you know like you can play with that and you don't have to be loud to be somebody and that was so helpful for her because yeah that's again our society you have to be more bold yeah but that doesn't mean loud it doesn't mean loud. It doesn't, it doesn't have to mean loud. I mean, yeah. And, and making it just more suitable for you, more tailored to you, more bespoke to you. That's so powerful. And again, I think we do a really bad job with our children that they have to be in the same box and the same, we say in German, you have to go through the same hose, like everybody pushing pushing them through the same hose it's just stupid but uh, yeah there's but there's, my, my there's, private school where my 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 business which makes millions will fund the private school so that everybody can come you know like with all the individual path that's still a dream of mine but I will do that I swear well I can tell that because you know again your work is expansive it's not it's limitless it is a journey and I think it's so interesting that you say like in German culture, the, the idea of that tunnel is very like, I think that's something I'm, uh, that resonates with me that there's so many parts of life where people put you in a box or they put you in this like, hey, because I've done this this way, you're going to do it this way. And man, it's taking us a lot of time to learn. It's taken us forever to talk about learning differences to learn about, um, yeah, how we all experience the world so differently. And I don't know if there was a time that those models ever really served anyone. And sure, there's certain things everyone should learn, you know, certain maths and science and- But is that true? Like- But no, no, no. but not to the depth that, some, that we have to, that we've been forced to. Yeah, it's, I listened to a fun podcast and the other day they said something like, um, and they were of, of our generation and, and we're, I, I'm making an assumption here, but I feel like we were in the generation of like, we hand wrote our essays <clears throat> and then in like high school, we had typewriters or some of us, you know, went to typewriters to typing our essays. Then like, for me, it was my senior year. I moved to learning computer typing, which was different than typewriter typing. Um, you know, and so for, um, this example that this podcast gave was just a, their kind of a comedy show. And they said, I always told my family that I would never like need a, like I would never need a calculator. And if I did like, you know, 
something would appear like and he was like now we have computers on our pockets like in our pockets all the time I have a calculator anytime I need I wouldn't need these big trigonometry I wouldn't need you know some of these high level concepts of math like cool if that interests you what if there and I think that's what stem programs do right so there are certain things that have slowly grown into um what are ways to introduce kids to these things so that they can see what excites them and then based on what excites them, they can make some more, you know, choices about college because college is so expensive in, in most of the world or, and, but not everyone needs colleges. You know, there's the, it's, we're just starting, but it feels like slow development from, again, from like handwriting everything to, I'm never going to need those maths to, no, we have everything we need <laughs> in our hands. My <laughs> math teacher in high school, she told us when she was a young mathematician, is that the right word? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had, they had a calculator who could calculate like four plus two or four, um, four times four. And it was as big as a washing machine or a tumbler, a dryer. And it took like 20 minutes. And they were like, they were like, hooray, four times four is 16. And this huge machine got it right. Like, oh, yeah. And now, oh, my gosh. And but that's yeah, why, that's... you know, Mika, my daughter, she hates math and I hate that she already hates math because I love math. But these teachers in, in first to third grade were really horrible and so dry. And, and she's like, why should I learn this shit when I have this calculator like next to me? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. It, to me, like having, yeah, I don't know. It's well, like if, if you yeah. never sing, you, you're not used to singing and singing is like a low priority and math is high why is that that's just not logical right and we don't yeah. have time for everything so we put in math and a lot of language theory and a lot of pressure to learn some certain rivers of uh, african countries and then after the test you 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 don't know them in five minutes it's so stupid but we no. don't have to talk about that <laughs> okay but you know i think you yeah, Mika, Mika is your daughter? Uh, yeah. I think that this is where our conversation is relevant though, where she says, I like, whether it's hard for her, she doesn't like it, she's just not interested. Something about it didn't spark joy. It doesn't spark curiosity. It doesn't spark, um, yeah, maybe that's it. Like, I think curiosity is part of it. Like, oh, I wanna know more. Like, how, how do we get to that? Some kids really love that or like you said, it's not the teacher. It's not the style. She's not learning in the style for her. To me, some of these concepts are like, well, how, how would you want me to apply this? And why should I, why does it matter? Why should it matter? And so we are not often taught the why. And I think in our exploration with folks, it's like, you have those answers inside of you. We can help give, we can help guide you with questions to help you come to those answers yourself. Because yeah, singing is not important to a lot of people, but why would you, why would this tool be helpful for you? Um, for those who it does, you know, it does spark a little curiosity or, you know, that scared excitement that we get about things. Math can do that to me. I can be scared of it and a little excited if I know that's my like writing a composition. Um, because now I write songs, but I don't write any of them down. But like now I have a better sense of why it was important to, to learn the basics. That's right. I, yeah. I don't care so much about the value of the note as much as I care about the emphasis on the word that I want. Oh, okay. Well, that has to be shorter, right? So if someone asked me to write out all of these songs I have written, like hundreds of songs that I've written for people, it would be, I'd be like, where's the software? <laughs> I'm going to hire someone to do that. It's not my, not my skill, but I would get excited about seeing it on paper and then understanding it. It's almost like backwards, like learning. Oh, it cool. Reverse engineering songs. So you yeah. are like, I could, I just saw that on Instagram, like one um, woman was gifting that to her husband for the wedding anniversary, a, a, a customized song for her, uh, for yeah. him with, with stories about their marriage. I thought that's so cool. And you're doing that too. That's what I do. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I started out just doing lullabies because again, relevant to our conversation, I would be in family music classes and the moms would not feel comfortable singing out loud. And I was like, are these moms just not singing to their babies? 
like, that's just hurts my heart. Not a parent, but as someone who like has a very strong bond with children and maybe they can just sense it in me because I'm, you know, I'm playful and curious and I'm not afraid to express myself in lots of silly ways. Like our mom's just not doing that. And, and what a lost opportunity. And so I moved into, well, it would moms sing to their babies if it was a song that had their words Aww. and it was simple. It wasn't Adele. It wasn't Beyonce. It wasn't like our idea of what singing is. It was very simple, accessible, you know, and it was their so, words, not somebody that else's. That's the bridge I wanted to ask you. That like, is the bridge. From the, from the musical therapy, you mm -hmm. came into music coaching via the lullabies. Yeah. Yeah. Via watching. Yeah. Feeling there was a gap in adults not feeling comfortable with their voice in front of others. That's understandable in a group, you know, group family session that that might be understandable, but with their own children, like, why not? Why are you and, not? And what are reasons they tell you that's like, oh, wow, that's another black <sighs> hole we could fall yeah. into. Yeah, I think it's, you know, a lot of kind of what we started out talking about, oh, someone told them something about their voice, or they just think I'm not a good singer. I also just think people have this false, it's not a false sense. It's been, it's been shown to us that beautiful sound just falls out of people's faces. <laughs> I would say that. <laughs> And it's a good visual, but it's not true. Some people, of course, yes, have a very natural ability, but everyone needs practice and training. You know, anyone who's on those stages that we see on the TV shows, I really think that gives us a warped sense of the world because they also have like a terrible singer section. And I'm, and th those are funny, but um, to me, it's like a missed opportunity because um, I believe, I truly believe everyone can and should sing if they, if it calls to them. And I want to show them that they're, my method of teaching is a way I wasn't taught It's like all of the things that we're talking about. It's the in-between. It's not what's on paper. It's not the way things have been done in the past. It's not in the tunnel. Like we don't sing do re mis. There's none of that. We are, we're definitely like giving you tools to understand how your voice works, how, how it feels to you. So you can say, oh, I didn't know that part of my voice existed. I didn't know I could do that. That's through play and curiosity. And these moms were not showing a willingness to be playful and curious, even though they had paid this money to come to a class where that's exactly what they want their children to learn. They were having a hard time modeling it. And so I thought, yeah, at its simplest, if I created a song that was their words, so it was nothing foreign, a simple melody. So it's not hard. It's not too high for a vocal range. It's never too low. Like I keep it very, that's where it's this started. And I wrote, um, a handful of those. And one of my favorite stories is about um, actually some, some kids I got to see older now who sing their songs every night. To oh. brothers. Yeah. And their mom said <clears throat> one of them, one of her boys had had a stroke in u utero and they learned this when he was like two and they were watching him walk and they saw that his, his gait was off a bit. And they, so they took him for some testing and his language a bit was a bit delayed. And so they said, let's check into this. And they found that he had, he had had a, a stroke um, before he was born. And so they were working actively again with speech therapy, with occupational therapy, with physical therapy. Um, and I, at first it was just a song. And then she said, well, Lisa, could we like, I think he has the words. I think he's choosing not to use them sometimes because he knows the word. She gave me some examples. He knows the word for milk. Like I will ask him, can you get the milk out of the fridge or whatever? And he would do it. Um, but then he was, he was having trouble like expressing the words he knew. So she's like, I think he knows them. He's just having trouble expressing them. So literally in the song for him, we wrote, we want to hear your voice to know what you have to say, to use, so use it proud while we sing this song and say, and that was like the bridge leading up to the chorus, right? And then mom every night would say, you are strong. Oh, and I so have then I put, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it was very, very meaningful. 
um, for, for me as well. So then we put an echo in so that he would, he would not have to, but he would hear a voice to sing along. So she'd say, you are strong, I am strong. You are brave, I am brave. You are smart, I am smart. You are funny, I am funny. And then we'd say, you can do anything. His name is Jagger. Jagger, Kai, it's no wonder why we love you. So oh, that was the, the simplest. I mean, that's affirmation therapy every affirmation night. Therapy. Hello. And he sang it on day two. He memorized it. And she said, Lisa, he's using his words. He's starting to, he hears me say, we want to hear your voice to know what you have to say. We want to know what you have to say. So use it proud, use it strong, use it. I think we put a few different, um, you know, ways for him to access, like, so that we would be able to, you know, and when he heard the song, he knew like what that meant. Um, we didn't say loud. We didn't say, you know, there was no directive. It was just like, uh, how do you want to feel? We want you to use it proudly, use it strong, use it whatever. And so he, um, you know, it was part of his language therapy as it turned out. And so it moved morphed from that to, and that is the music therapy side of me, right? That's the that's definitely mixing my background in making music accessible to everyone for, for the parents, for the kids using, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like not about the song. Like the song was the way into his brain, but then he translated it and was able to do something, you know, yes, he sings the song, but yes, he started talking more. I mean, there are people who stutter and they never stutter when they sing, right? It's so interesting. Yeah. So it's that, that was the bridge. And I'm so glad you asked, because it's, it's really fun for me to share these pieces because again, then it became the, well, what about the adults? What did we, what did we miss out on in when we were seven, eight, nine? And I could tell you more stories, um, but. And when, I mean, for grownups, affirmations are so powerful and, and um songs are so powerful so you customize songs also kind of for the same like like this this boy to to have my personal affirmations in a song or yeah yeah and actually what I do now this is so fun this is a good um time to mention that I my favorite part of my one-on-one -on -one work with people is when a client comes to their voice work session which is singing um And a lot of people just need to like learn the foundations of their voice. So I start, you know, everyone comes to me differently. So we, we talk about their background and, but I kind of like give them an introduction to the voice from my perspective and what I've seen works for a lot of people who traditional voice lessons have not worked for. And so one of the first things we do is set an affirmation or an intention rather for the session. So how do you want to feel during the session? How do you want to feel today, this week, this month? Like what, yeah, what could we do to help kind of imprint that through your voice in a new way? The great thing about Zoom is people can be on mute, right? They can hear me, but they can mute themselves if they want to in this, in this part. Um, Even with and, you, the, um, you, the muting is, is necessary. I, I'm open to, I think people come with different levels of, feeling comfortable. Well, I'll say this, Zoom is getting a little better, but there was a time when, when I'm playing piano, which a lot of people don't do with the Zoom work, they don't use an instrument because the, the timing yeah. yes. is yeah. off, right? Yeah. But what that allows for is when I'm playing and I'm singing, I will, they'll give me, let's say a word or a phrase. Then I, because this is how my brain works, I hear a little melody. And so I put it into, onto the piano, sometimes onto the guitar. For a long time, Zoom couldn't hear guitar. It's more my primary instrument, but um, so piano is, is primarily what I use. So I will sing and give them, give them the, the intention or the affirmation back. And there was enough lag on Zoom and there was enough, like I, the microphone can only hear me, that when the client sang it back as, a, as an echo or repeated after me, I couldn't hear them anyway because the speaker didn't know who to listen to, right? The Zoom speakers didn't oh, know wow. who to listen to. Yep. So um, there was a time that worked really well. So actually they didn't put themselves on mute. It just automatically kind of, I would say to them because of the way Zoom is working and the timing of music and all of our voices, it doesn't know what to listen to. I often can't hear you. So, 
you know, do what you will with that. But, and some people sing very quietly, they sing to themselves and that's okay because that's it. To me in that moment, it's not about singing. It's about using your voice with the intention that you're setting. And so we write a song together. First thing, first things first, you know, as a part of our warm up. And then I decided, you know, that's my favorite thing I do with one-on-one -on -one clients. And you can only work with so many one-on-one -on -one folks. So I started a vocal membership, which is meets every Monday morning. And we start the week with a voice activation exercise. And then we set an intention. And so I do the same thing, but I have, you know, 10 people's intentions coming in and we just like take turns with everyone's. And it's just like, it's just a song that comes from the moment from the people who are in the room. And we, you know, there's also power in seeing other people sing your intention back to you. Um, and so that has been a real joy of like taking this work to more people. Um, also, you know, you start your voice. Um, everyone in the world where you're using your voice, a warm up feels good. So we just kind of start the start the week off with this activation, and it's been really um, wonderful. And it's a good, you know, it's a it's a way to build community, a Zoom community, with lots of friendly faces and boxes. And and again, everyone's on Zoom, um, or sorry, on uh, mute. So that's a safe place to watch people. Like you know, some really you can see that they're checking with their body. You know, they're getting more comfortable. Everyone stays on camera, which is really lovely because I think that creates a safe space. Like if you're off camera, if everyone is off camera, you don't know where you are and who's Absolutely. watching you. Yeah, I think that's really a, a, an important part of the work that I do, that people are present, if they can be, or just say, you know, I'm, I'm sick in bed, but I'm listening. We, then we just can picture, oh, we know where you are and thanks for being here. So yeah, another way to set those affirmations. But I have written a song for a coach who wanted to gift a song about her work and what the message she wants to um, kind of share with the women that she works with. And we wrote this huge song, like it's seven minutes. It's a, oh, it's a wow. beast, but it's so beautiful. And so it like so describes her and her work and her mission. And so she's gifted it to her clients as a, as a means of, a, of an affirmation that also has an affirmation piece with a beautiful kind of like at the end, you're just kind of all of these affirmations are flowing and it's very unique, but that's, that's the thing. It's music is so personal. So the ability to personalize it brings me so much joy. Honestly, it's, it's one of the favorite things I do. And I record in a studio, um, you know, I've had, I've worked with people online, like Fiverr during the pandemic, I recorded in my closet. <laughs> I like learned how to create a, um, a studio in my closet and have people engineer it from around the world. Like it's, you know, it's becomes this nice collaborative um, yeah. effort. And again, it's never, I just feel like the guide or the channel for that. You know, you tell me what you, like you mentioned this woman who wants to sing her husband. I've done, um, I've done a few projects like that. Um, and then also said, you know, if you want to be the one singing this to your partner, I'll also coach you through yeah, that's so cool. getting comfortable to do that yes. like for a wedding or an anniversary. Yeah. yeah. So it's, I think that's just the embodiment of like playfulness. No one way is the right way. Um, it, like the way that I have used, used music embodies the sense of joy that that like we follow what brings us excitement and um and that means we get to go off book that means we get to do things differently than our culture than our family than our partners do and take a sense of um an, an opportunity to recognize what brings us the most joy and it's so i mean music is how many notes is in one octave or what is that Eight. Eight, yeah right? it's like with that you can build all this music it's just that's incredible to me and it's mm -hmm. like every day is different we have all these possibilities it's it's a, it's it's a symbol also right for yeah for the whole wide world yeah yep exactly here are some markers mix and match them to your 
liking and um I know you thank do that you with so much for this universe you opened up that was so much fun and I always ask in the end what's your message to the whole wide world because the whole wide world can listen to this podcast oh you know I think I just think it's really important to trust your voice and there's lots of ways to access that and there's lots of ways we've talked about it whether it's your physical voice whether it's your inner voice I just think um your voice is is the most important instrument you have and it's always with you and uh again both internal and externally being able to trust that serves us from a young age um or backtracking for those of us who need just to be reminded of what that looks like and what that feels like serves us so well and that's that's that comes into play with you know both joyful and tough conversations that happen day to day um with children with partners with family with professional conversations you know that's I just think it's such an important thing. I, it's taken me a long time to trust my voice. And I know now that I'm getting faster. It's, it's getting faster for me to, to access what truly resonates, what, tru what, I, what I truly believe. And, and then I make decisions based on my knowing. And again, part of that is the inner hearing, hearing how does that, You know, how do I really feel about that decision? Does it light me up? Does it bring me joy or does it drain my energy? Okay, well then what's my next step? I've got to trust. I've got to trust that that's here for a reason. I might not know why, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna honor it. I'm gonna trust it. And I'm gonna keep learning because we don't always get it right on the first try. And, uh, and, and to me, there's no right or wrong. It's just a process. It's just a, it is a journey. It is a curiosity. It's a, checking in and it becomes intentional so yeah it's, it's thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your creativity and your story with us thank you I'm really grateful me. we had this, this conversation. conversation thank you bye I forgot to ask Lisa about her website and all the places you can find her on social media, but her name is unique too. So Lisa Townsend music.com is her website and it's beautiful and you have to check it out. And I love how like joy is my compass and using your voice and, and listening to resonance is so similar and in the end whatever work you do in your day how you spend your time isn't it always about connection within and with yourself and with other people it doesn't matter if you work at the public transportation um like you sell tickets there and people are arriving they need something and you're giving them energy and a good day and, and the feeling of being heard. I mean, every job is important. And if you spend time with children, your own or others, you have an influence on them. Oh, I'm really like fired up with this, with this work and, and um, my message and every person on this planet has a message and a gift to share. And maybe this, episode sparked something in you that you want to share with the world like maybe you want to paint or to sing or it's not a creative endeavor it's like I want to teach what 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 is it like find what you want what's important to you and if you want to dig into your dreams and your wish and I can highly recommend my book to you the joy compass And it's written for men and for women. So the first part is for men and the second part is for women. And it's not exactly the same book, of course, otherwise it would be weird to put, put that in one book, but it's in a different language. 
and I apologize on the book for all the LGBTQ. I'm so bad at in spelling in English. I, you know, like if you are not heterosexual, I don't dare to give you relationship advice or, I mean, the life advice is applicable for you too. And you will enjoy and learn from this book, but I enjoyed to just use he in the male's book as, as the pronouns and she in the female book to give couple advice for heterosexual couples directly to the heart. And yeah, that's just my apology that this is for female and for male straight written, but if you can have some really beautiful takeaways for yourself, of course, please transform the language to today or, or your pronoun, um, which is applicable to you. That's important to me. I uh, respect all relationships and, and I feel like we're a human family on this planet and we should get our shit together and not um, spend time and money in wars and killing each other. If it's a little war at home or a, a big war worldwide, let's be kind and, and focus on what we love and what brings the music out in, in us and what which excites us. <sighs> let's create joy, people. And I'm so thankful that you're listening to my podcast. Please share it with your friends. Share it with whomever you think this episode would be helpful. And join me on Instagram at Joy is My Compass. I'm sharing stories there and uh, posts, and I'm just like sharing my world there with you. And I would like to be connected to you. And of course, if you want to dive deeper into your joyful life and create the life you really want to live and, and experience joy every day and get rid of what's not serving you, join the Joy Academy. It's a such a beautiful wonderful program you have time in there it's space in there you do whatever you want when you want to do it we have live calls but you have all the buffet of beautiful exercises and master classes ready for you whenever you have time and energy and um yeah you just dive full on into what do i want how do i want to create my life so joyismycompass.com is my website and I'm so happy that you are here. Have an amazing day.